Thank you to everyone who's joined us for this afternoon Meet an Earth Scientist session. I'm Alicia Newton and I'm the Director of Science and Communications at the Geological Society of London. And we've been working with a group of societies across Europe to help engage people and especially girls and young women in the geosciences. So today we're very excited to give you all a chance to meet an actual earth scientist, Lydia, who is working on green energy technologies. So she's actually based in the Netherlands, but is from uh, this side of the pond. And I'm going to ask her to tell us a little bit about how she got interested in geosciences and what she does. And then we will open it up to any questions that you might have. So since we're recording, we're not going to have people speaking. So if you have any questions, please start putting them in the Q&A box and we'll start to answer them after Lydia's told us about herself. So thank you and welcome Lydia. Great, thank you, Asha. Um, I'll just quickly share my screen. Um, Yes, uh, good afternoon everyone. My name's Lydia Rycroft uh, and I work for a company called TNO in the Netherlands as an earth scientist. Um, so what my company do, we basically are a research organisation and we sit in between academia and industry to try and get the most novel and new technologies that are up and coming actually applied in the real world. So I work on the CO2 storage team specifically within our energy transition unit. The whole point of our unit is to look at technologies that can uh, mitigate climate change and the technology that I really work on is CCS as a geologist. So I'm just going to do a quick 10 minute presentation before we get into questions. Um, I'll quickly introduce what CCS, CCS is. I know not everyone is familiar with it um, and quickly go over projects that are currently ongoing in the CCS world. And then I'll get into a bit more of what I do specifically and the questions that earth scientists in this area are trying to answer. So that's how do we store CO2, is it safe and how much CO2 can we store and where. So just quickly, uh, carbon capture and storage um, is a climate mitigation technology. Uh, I know it's not as well known as some other options like solar and wind, so I just wanted to give a, a quick overview which I think this picture shows. Um, so this is a specific example from a location in Amsterdam, just because that's near where I'm based. Um, but basically it's taking CO2 from big emitters, so industry emitters or, or the power sector, and then you compress that CO2 into uh, either a liquid or you can keep it in a more compressed gas form. And then either by pipeline or by a ship, you take it to a storage location. And in Europe, that's mainly going to be an offshore site so in the Netherlands and in the UK, that's going to be the North Sea, um, but you can do this onshore. You then, uh, through yeah, an injection site, a platform, you then inject it deep into the underground. And that's where the geology aspect comes in. Um, so why are we doing CCS? That's really because it's good at capturing these large emitters. So that could be uh, cement production, steel production, um, refining of oil and gas. Anywhere we've got a really large emission of CO2, you then attach a capture unit, um, so that's where chemical engineers come in. There's lots of different types of capture technology. Um, it can be um, direct air capture or, yeah, there's different types which I won't go into, but once you've captured it, it's then that pipeline and storage aspect that as an earth scientist I look into. So I just wanted to add uh, this slide just to show you some pictures of what that looks like in the real world. So this picture on the right here is from a site where they're actually injecting CO2 at the moment in Norway. So this is a site called Sleipner. And this diagram on the left, I just like because it shows a bit of perspective as to what we're talking about with the geology. So this infrastructure on the right here is shown at the very, very top of this diagram in the sea here. So this is how big that platform is in real life. And to give that some scale, they've also got the Eiffel Tower in this figure. So we're looking at about three kilometers deep is generally in the North Sea the kind of depth you're looking at injecting the CO2 into different rocks at that depth. Um, but generally across the world, you're looking at two to five kilometers is pretty common for the depths you're looking at to inject the CO2 in. 
And these are similar to oil and gas um, production pipelines, but we're looking at injecting into the rock, not getting anything out. Uh, so is CCS really happening? Yes, it is. Uh, there's 17 operational sites at the moment ongoing. And here's a list of those that are in quite late stages of development and nearly happening. So in Europe, uh, Norway are really leading the way on this. They have had a project active for quite a few years now, Sleipner. Um, and they're very close to starting another project, which is called uh, Northern Lights. Um, but the UK, this is quite a hot topic at the moment. They really want to start using hydrogen and to produce hydrogen at the moment, the main way the UK is looking at doing that is actually by using natural gas. So in the production of hydrogen, you're actually going to produce a lot of CO2 and the UK government uh, is currently planning to store that CO2 with CCS. So hydrogen is a hot topic. Uh, as a result of that, they're also looking into CCS. And in the Netherlands, it's a similar story. Uh, I'm working on a project called Portos in the port of Rotterdam uh, and that is actually looking at uh, a refinery and also a cement plant and taking CO2 from those two industrial processes in the port and storing them in the North Sea. But I just wanted to include this slide to show that there are a lot of projects ongoing uh, from Australia to America. Yeah, it's a very international technology. So this is just a picture of the site that I'm working on. So uh, this is the port of Rotterdam. And just to highlight that uh, a good thing about CCS is that you're going to be looking at it in industrial areas already. So because it's high point uh, source emissions, you're really looking at putting it in places where there's already a lot of industrial action. So a lot of infrastructure is already there. In this port, for example, they already capture and transport CO2 and they actually currently pump it into their greenhouse greenhouses. So they have a lot of greenhouses in the Netherlands to grow fruits and vegetables um, and they benefit from having extra CO2. So a lot of that infrastructure is already there, um, but they're looking at putting this into a much bigger scale, capturing lots more CO2 and actually storing it permanently to avoid climate change. So this is just a map diagram. So this area you can see here extending into the sea is this area on the map. And then where I come in with TNO is we're looking at how do you pipeline, how do you develop this pipeline and then store it offshore in the North Sea in these uh, depleted gas fields. So that's a quick, yeah, whistle stop tour of what CCS is. Um, I now wanted to go into quickly just a bit more detail into as a nurse scientist, where can you work? Where are the questions to answer really? So how do we store CO2? So um, yeah, it's, it's a well-known process. We've actually been using it in the oil and gas industry. CO2 has been pumped underground since the 1950s, but actually for the purpose of trying to get more oil out. But we are very familiar with how CO2 um, moves under the surface. Um, but there are lots of different elements to that, and it's quite complicated fluid dynamics, chemistry, um, mechanics, and that's where the science comes in. So there's four main ways that it's trapped. First, you actually need a structure to trap it. So you want to have a um, porous rock with holes in that you inject that CO2 into. And you want to structurally have an impermeable rock above that, that where the CO2 can't travel through it. So you want a rock that really takes the CO2 in and then one that won't let it travel any further. Then you also have residual, which is where the CO2, once it's in the rock, actually between these tiny little holes in the rocks, it quite wants to stay there. So if you think of if you squeeze a sponge and the water will come out, but actually when you let go, it's still wet. There's still water that's quite tightly trapped in there um, just through the physics of that. Solubility, so CO2 actually dissolves in water. So when you inject this into a rock that say has um, salty water, residual salty water in there, the CO2 will actually want to dissolve. Um, so CO2 is more buoyant than most things, well, than anything that will be in the reservoir before you put it in there. So the CO2 will want to rise to the top of this containment rock that you're putting it in. But eventually it will dissolve, sink to the bottom of the reservoir, and that stops it from wanting to escape, which is what we're aiming for. And then the very last one is it will eventually, once it's dissolved and in the water, it will turn into a mineral, a carbonate. And once it's in rock form, it's perfectly safe. It's never going to leave. It's never going to escape. And yeah, that's the end game in a thousand year timescale that we're looking at. 
But initially, as a geologist, what you're looking at is this structural trapping element. So what rocks can you put it in in a certain sequence that will prevent this CO2 from reaching the surface? So these four diagrams, um, uh, they're a bit technical. I won't go into lots of detail, but um, it's showing how oil and gas is trapped in rocks. And fundamentally, the science that we know from oil and gas being trapped in rocks can also apply to trapping CO2 in rocks. So this is very well known science. We've been extracting oil and gas for 100 years. It's just applying that in, in a different way. And uh, in the geology world, there's lots of different terms for this, these types of trapping mechanisms. So you're looking at curvature or faulting or how these rocks have moved. And also salt domes can just create lots of different ways that you'll actually trap the CO2 in the rock by the way the different rock layers are interacting. Um, so this is just to show a large scale of the sort of what we do as a geologist and how the rocks are deposited, where they are, their features is really important for knowing how and where we can store CO2. And I've just included this diagram. So it shows um, these different injection sites at the top and then at the depth, you actually get the CO2 bloom. So once you inject it at a point, it's going to spread along your rock and then start to dissolve. And that's where you see these fingers coming down as the CO2 dissolving into the residual water and starting to sink. Um, I just included this because I wanted to show that as a scientist, people are working at very different scales. So some will be looking um, as A and B show at the very tiny millimeter, centimeter scale at the fluid interactions and the fluid dynamics and the chemistry that's happening at that scale. But you also get the geologists that are looking at a 100 kilometer scale. Where is the CO2 going to migrate to? What are the rock characteristics in that area? Um, where's the groundwater flow in that area? Which, which way is a plume going to want to migrate on a much larger scale? So there's lots of work for earth scientists to do in this area. But the main question I think all geologists in this area get asked um, is, will the CO2 stay down there and how do we know that? Um, so there's a lot of science in answering that question. Um, but the main thing is that the CO2, um, so that's what this picture on the right shows, is that you're compressing it and putting it under a lot of pressure and deep underground, and it's in a very compressed state, which is good because it means for all the CO2 you're emitting, you don't actually need as much storage space to store it deep underground because you're really putting it into a much smaller space. So uh, with regards to like the physics and maths, you're looking at um, this buoyancy force that you've created. So the CO2 really wants to rise to the surface and that creates a force. Um, and within the rock you have, even if it is impermeable, you're going to have really small, small gaps within that rock. So um, for a liquid to force itself into those tiny holes, that's called a capillary force. And you wanna make sure that those two forces, that the buoyancy doesn't overcome that and rise to the surface. So that's what, um, the mass and physics modelers within earth science will be looking at and the fluid people that are experts in fluid dynamics. Uh, on a larger scale, you're looking at the geometry of the rocks. How thick are they? How far across a map would they extend? And then you've also got the geomechanics, which is the integrity. Um, how high can I get the pressures to before this rock breaks? Um, yeah, how strong is a rock? How sturdy? Where are the forces? Are there earthquakes in this area? Those sorts of questions. Um, but overall, yes, CO2 storage is safe, and as geologists, we know that. Um, so oil and gas is naturally occurring in these areas. Now that we've taken the oil and gas out, we're looking to put CO2 in. If it's stored oil and gas safely for millions of years, we're pretty certain it can do that with CO2 as well, under safe conditions. There's lots of projects that have put CO2 underground. None of them have leaked. There's 17 large-scale facilities currently operating that are currently putting more than 30 million tons of CO2 under the ground per year. None of them have leaked. They're all safe. Um, you just have to put the regulations there. And in Europe especially, um, they have some of the most stringent regulations on CO2 storage. Um, we have a storage directive on CO2 storage specifically. And the regulation is really there to make sure any operator of these sites um, really has to have very, very high standards of safety. So. And at TNO, that's the, that's the sort of thing we work on. What, how fast can you inject? How much can you inject and keep it safe? So uh, the big question that we answer as earth scientists um, in terms of the operator that wants to do this is how much can they store and where can they store it? Um, so this picture is a bit old, um, but I just think it nicely shows that geology is very much dependent on where you are. So in the Netherlands, 
I'm working on gas fields. So where they've extracted gas, they're now looking at putting CO2 in. Um, but say you're working in the UK, you're going to actually probably be looking at depleted oil fields just because the geology is different even in areas of the North Sea. So I think that's an interesting element that just because you're an expert in CCS doesn't mean you're going to need the same knowledge at different, yeah, different sites around the world. So that can make it a really interesting job. So here's just an example for me specifically uh, where I am in the Netherlands. Uh, this is an example of the offshore sites that we are looking at uh, for this Portos project I mentioned. So here on the right in this table, we can store it in salty water, and these are some examples of those reservoirs, or we can store it in a depleted gas field, and that's these reservoirs here. And then we say, having looked at the geology, we think it can store a maximum of, for example here, that's 110 million tonnes. But then they also need to know, okay, so it can store that, but at what rate can I store it? So then we also look at how quickly you can inject. So yeah, those are just some of the questions that I answer on a day-to-day -day basis. And I hope I've given a bit of an overview of the different questions earth scientists are currently answering. So, yeah, thank you. Thanks so much, Lydia. Um, and we've got a bunch of questions to throw at you. So start with the first one, and that's what degrees do you need in order to get into this interest industry? So if it's CCS as a whole, there are, there are just so many jobs because there is the, the earth science storage bit, but also that includes um, engineering. So you could be a petroleum engineer looking at the wells or the pipelines. But then there's also chemical engineers that do the capture side. So in terms of degrees, it does cover, it does cover a whole, whole range depending on what aspect. But in terms of earth scientists, I also think it covers all. So whether that's the chemistry, the mechanics, the physics, yeah, it covers a whole whole range. Great. And then along those lines, how did you get into the industry? Uh, so for me personally, it began, I hadn't heard of CCS until I started my geology degree. Um, but I did start my geology degree really wanting to work on, you know, green energy. And I really wanted to work towards climate change mitigation. And then whilst doing my degree, we did a module on uh, I think it was fluid dynamics or hydrogeology, and they mentioned that this science was useful for CO2 underground and that CCS existed. And so then I decided to do my master's project on CCS. So that's how I, I got started. Um, just a question for me, what made you decide to do geology as a degree? So I think for me, I remember watching um, Al Gore's uh, famous film called An Inconvenient Truth. And that got me really interested in climate change. And for me, I became fascinated that, that humans alone could have such an impact on our planet. And I think geology for me was this idea that everything around me, my computer, my telephone, we've taken these things out of the ground. And I just became really obsessed with the idea that metals and concrete and how, how do we get something so specific from what just looks like dirt and earth and rocks and how does that happen? And yeah, I think that's what got me initially interested in geology as a whole. Great. We have some technical questions too. So um, what is the difference between storing onshore rather than offshore? And then I'll combine that with, are there any drawbacks to putting CO2 under the ground? Like for instance, environmental or economic impact? Okay, yeah. So um, the first question, it's really dependent on the geology. So um, there's no fundamental difference between onshore and offshore, apart from um, operationally offshore, you've obviously got the aspect that it's a lot harder to get your infrastructure there and have people working out there. So there's, there's that element that can make it more expensive. Um, it's really, we're working on depleted oil and gas fields. And so for Europe, that's really an offshore element. And also Europe's quite densely populated, so um, working onshore becomes a bit more difficult. But in areas of America and Australia, um, where there's already a lot of onshore oil and gas work, um, yeah, onshore CO2 storage is a lot more dominant. So, yeah, it's really where the oil and gas industry is. But moving forward, um, it'll also move to different types of reservoirs. So that's, that might change. And, yeah, the negatives to putting CO2 underground, obviously it costs money. Um, so there has to be that incentive as an emitter of why, why, would I, why would I bother doing that? So in Europe, we have a thing called the Emissions Trading Scheme. And that's basically a, um, 
yeah, a, a CO2 tax where for emitting CO2, you pay money. And so that's where the incentive for CO2 storage comes because you don't have to pay that tax if you put it underground permanently and avoid climate change. Um, environmental, um, it's something you have to be aware of. And as a geologist, that, that's what we're doing to make sure it doesn't leak. Um, but, but we're very, very certain that you can do it without it leaking. And we monitor that extensively, but should it reach the surface, it will be in very small amounts. Um, it will be monitored. And at the end of the day, CO2 is being emitted to the atmosphere anyway. It, it's, it's, it's in the air, so it's not as if it's a very toxic chemical that we're putting down there. But it's not that we want it to leak or we're happy with it leaking. That's definitely something that's a very small risk, but one we take very seriously. Great. And um, how do you see this technology changing in the future? Um, so I would say a lot of the, if you look at textbooks from 10, 15 years ago, they're really looking at applying this to coal-fired power stations. And already we're looking at getting rid of coal completely. So we're not even capturing CO2 from that. We're just not having uh, coal-based emissions. So um, yeah, I think CCS is really gonna develop onto different technologies. So for elements like steel production and cement production, um, you're always going to emit CO2 just inherently in the process. So unless you use different materials, um, you're going to need to capture the CO2. So I think, yeah, and also hydrogen production, if it's from natural gas, you need to capture those emissions. So what you apply CCS to, I think, is going to change in the future. But then also a big change will be the capture technology. So these are the more novel aspect, um, the newer technologies. I think these will become cheaper, more efficient, more readily available as time goes on. Great. And um, going back to degrees, do you think that an environmental degree will help you get into this field? Definitely. So a big uh, point of debate at the moment is the regulation and policy around this. And also you have to conduct environmental impact assessments for this. Uh, but in Europe, especially, so we have it in Norway, but that's not necessarily under EU regulations um, for certain aspects. Um, but so lots of projects are now starting under the EU directives. Um, so the regulations there, but operators aren't sure on how they can meet these regulations. How do you show that it's not having an impact on the environment, even though it's not? It, how do you prove that? So definitely working in the environment area and policy and regulation, that's that's really up and coming for CCS. Great. And um, do you have a slightly contentious question, but do you think that CCS gives the industry a get out of jail free card to carry on polluting? I think CCS does have that image of um, it's an enabler for fossil fuels. Um, and I, I would hate to think that a operate, uh, oil and gas operator would just greenwash CCS and say, oh, yeah, yeah, we'll do it. And it's fine. We'll keep emitting, but we'll say we're going to do this. Um, I, I, you, I think we really need every technology, especially with um, targets like net zero by 2050. That's a huge, huge task. And I think this green energy revolution is going to need absolutely everything as quick as possible, wind, solar. And I just think CCS is going to be a really key transition technology. I don't think by 2050, we will be able to just stop producing fossil fuels and have yeah, uh, cheap energy for everyone. Um, so yes, it, it does enable the continued use of fossil fuels. But I, th I think that's also essential that we make fossil fuels clean. Um, in order to have clean energy for all. So I, I see how it can be twisted that way. And I really hope that the operators that say they're gonna do CCS are doing it seriously and they're actually going to invest lots of money to, to get it going. Great. So I think um, in the interest of time, I'd like to finish up with one sort of general question, but what would you say to anyone who wants to get into a field like this? whether it's CCS or other green energy technologies, if you're a 14 to 18 year old, what should you do to build that path? Yeah, so, um, yeah, so to get into geology specifically, I think as long as you're taking science subjects at school, um, you don't have to take anything related to geology specifically, because I know not all schools offer geology at A-level, et cetera. So I think as long as you're getting a good background in math, physics, chemistry, um, you're definitely going to set yourself up really well to work in sciences and the energy transition in general. Um, 
yeah, if you're interested in it, I've put up some useful links here that you can read up on. There's a lot of free material, um, short courses, textbooks available, databases. Um, at university level, there's some summer schools to learn more. Um, but yeah, I think, I think, because obviously like internships and work experience in that level are good, but for CCS specifically, that would be quite difficult because it is such a new technology and it's, yeah, it's not wide, widely deployed. Um, so yeah, I'd say read up and learn, but as long as you're, yeah, you're getting some science in at school, all the options are open to you, definitely. Great. Well, um, thank you so much, Lydia. And if you do have questions about what sort of careers are available to you, like if you've done a geology degree or geography or environmental science, um, I encourage you to go to the Geological Society's website and look at our careers, pathways, resources. And you know, just to echo Lydia, a geology degree is open for everyone. So don't worry if you didn't manage to take one at an A-level, you should be able to look into doing one um, just from STEM and geography type A-levels. So um, thank you everyone for joining us today. And um, thank you, Lydia, for taking your time. And don't forget, we have three more sessions throughout the day. So please tune into them if you'd like. And also we'll be putting this on YouTube in the next few weeks. So you can tell all your friends if they'd like to watch this and um, learn about CCS as a career path. So thank you everyone for all of your time. And thank, thank you for having me. Okay. Thank you, Thanks. everyone.